So um, today we're um, really lucky to have Chaoming Song from the Department of Physics here visiting us. So he's, he's actually in, at the Gables campus. But this is one of those things where um, people come across your radar for different reasons. And uh, Chaoming came across my radar through Jose, who um, learned of a, a very special prize that uh, Chaoming won recently. And that's where I started to read a little bit more about what he does and um, continue to marvel at the fact that we have these pockets of people scattered all over the three campuses working in statistical modeling. Um, Chaming is kind of a very unique uh, pocket. So I'll tell you a little bit about him and what he does. Um, so he got his uh, bachelor's, he's all physics trained. He got his bachelor's in physics from Fudan University. Uh, he then did his PhD from the City University of New York in physics, finished that in 08. Um, then moved on as a postdoc to Northeastern University in something called the Center for Complex Network Research. You start to hear that complexity thing over and over again. He was then at the Farber, uh, Dana Farber Institute, as a research associate uh, in the uh, Center for Cancer Systems Biology. Uh, and then uh, back to Northeastern for a little bit as a, a research assistant professor in the Department of Physics. and then came here in 2013 as part of some sort of cluster hiring initiative in complex systems, and so that's, that's how he's here. Um, his research interest, he, I guess, he, some of what I read about him, he calls himself a statistical physicist. I'm so I know there's a journal called the Journal of Statistical Physics, <laughs> which is really cool. Um, <laughs> so, so what he writes about himself is he, he sort of lies at the intersection, his interest of statistical physics, network science, which we're going to hear about today, biological science, computational, social science. He's sort of looking at patterns in massive amounts of data. That's really one way to kind of summarize what he does. Um, recently, he's been focusing on properties of human dynamics and interactions at various scales of re resolution. So the prize that he won is, is a big deal. It was in 2015. Um, he received it in Spain. Um, it's called the Erdos Rainey Prize. Okay, and it, it go, it's sponsored by something called the Network Science Society, and it's awarded to a young scientist under 40 years of age um, for their research achievements in this broad area of network science. So many disciplines have this kind of thing where 40 seems to be a cutoff. In statistics, we have this thing called the COPS Award, which we give for a similar thing. Um, the way they define network science is it's sort of an interdisciplinary academic field studying complex networks coming from computers, social, biological, cognitive, and semantic networks. Um, and it pulls theories from mathematics, physics, statistics, computer science, and sociology. So one question I do have is, what is your Erdos number? Our, <laughs> my number is, is two or three. Two or three. <laughs> so the, the idea is if you publish with Erdos, then you get a number one. If you publish with somebody who has a number one, you get a number two, That's and so on. So given that you've gotten the prize. Uh, <laughs> I should have a small number. It's okay, so welcome. And, uh, thanks, uh, thanks. Thank you so much for the detailed introduction. All right, so first I should have some self-advertising about statistical physics because I have physics background. So what is statistical physics? <laughs> How a statistical physicist do? Basically, of course, we know the physicists have a well understanding of microscopy, detail of the world, say, for instance, quantum mechanics, for instance, Newton's law. So we have pretty well microscopic description of individual particles. Now, the problem is, of course, in, in our world, living world, we are not really observe one particle. <laughs> we are observe a microscopic object, right? So that is, for instance, the table, the room, the gas. That is what we observe. So in principle, in principle, of course, we can solve 10 to 23 number of Newton's equation to get the motion of each molecule, and we make a prediction about molecule. We make a prediction of the other world. However, apparently it fails. <laughs> it's a highly nonlinear differential equations, a huge number of <laughs> equations for equations you never solved. Now, statistical physics emerged as a field trying to bridge this to the gap between the microscopic phenomenon and the macroscopic phenomenon because we don't, simply don't care something about individual particles. So we care about some statistical measure of particles, for instance, the kinetic energy, which is the temperature, and the pressure, which is the average force response to a cistern, the volume, uh, all sorts of statistical properties. So basically, the idea become largely reduced if you can 
you are focused only on those microscopic quantities, you reduce it to a set of equations which is a relative small degree of freedom, and then you can try to solve it. So that is the basic goal. Now, of course, there's an advantage in statistical physics. Yes, we know all, almost all the microscopic details. Uh, we, I will say 99% of microscopic world is not for, to physicists. So we can try to build up a theory from microspec foundations. That's the advantage. So no, we know everything. However, it is still not easy <laughs> to make the connection, how to get rid of the most degree of freedom, how to take out the most majority part. So that is something interesting for statistical physics, why we have big overlap for complex system. All right. So of course, my topic is about complexities. So each time when I think about our world surrounding us, <laughs> the first word coming into my mind is complex. <laughs> Indeed, we now are surrounded by a world with hopeless complex from the society. There are over 7 billion population of individuals to communication system, which is connected by a huge number of solids, computers, and to cell phones. Our very ex existence is rooted on the ability of a huge number of cells to work in a seamless fashion. Right? So that's even our thinking, our thought, our reasoning, <laughs> our mind is also hidden in the world of a huge number of neurons connect to each other in our brain. So if we take a different system into a generic view. So this is a field called the complex system emerged. So there is, of course, no precise or rigorous definition of what is a complex system. However, there are some ingredients I listed here for a, a generic property for a complex system. So most of the time, the system we discuss is a system we don't have mastermind, for instance, no blueprint. So there is no essential core to design each piece of the system. Of course, the system gets some kind of self-organized. So the system, each component, get to interact with others, and eventually the global feature really emerge as a collective phenomenon instead of a central design system. Now, of course, the system may also evolve with the time. It could be dynamic, non-stationary. could be self-adapt be changed with the time. So these are some basic features occurs in many different systems. Um, take an example, for instance, we have for physicists, we have um, gas or liquid. So we have a huge number of molecules fly to each other, interact with each other. Of course, there is no design of one molecule can be dominant. So now, for instance, how are a gas become liquid? How liquid become gas? So we have on one or two control parameter, for instance. We can control temperature. We can control pressure. So that's an external control parameter we're going to have for a system. But why we change, for instance, temperature continuously, we have a big change for the feature of the material from liquid to gas, for instance, or to the solid. So there's something interesting here. And this is really related to statistics instead of single particle property. Because single particle, there's no change of the interaction or potential function for it individual molecules, what is the change is really about collective phenomena for the particle. No. All right. Now, there's a famous statement given by St uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, really in the beginning of the century. Say, I think the next century, of course, this century now, <laughs> will be the century of complex system, complexity. Now, to understand the complex system, the first thing we need is the connections, <laughs> how they connect to each other, called networks. Now, what is a network? Network is a collection of components, which we call nodes, work size, and of course, the interactions between nodes, we call links. So this is, of course, a simplified, discrete graphic representation of interaction between networks. Of course, there are the two things to figure out for a complex system. First of all, what is structure or topology of the interaction? And second, of course, what kind of interaction they have? Now, we're going to focus more in this talk on the first case, what is structure? Because we will see later, even the structure of the interaction already be complicated enough for most systems. And of course, when we have some clear idea about how to model the structure, we go to the next step, how to model interaction under the line. 
Now, basically speaking, we for each country system, we can do some digitalization. We have some network structure across green the picture. So each node defines the components, interaction de defines you know, the links. So there's some example I show. So for our online society, this is a famous plot from Facebook. So the Facebook map. Uh, of course, it's one time snapshot network. Apparently, should be dynamic change with the time. And you will see, even for one snapshot, you have highly inhomogeneous structure of the network, highly non trivial. And you cannot make a simple model out of this. And we're going to see the US part or European have much more denser connection with others. And there are a lot of questions related to the structure of the network, like I'm going to mention later on. And if you think about the industry or university, think about UN. Now, if we plot each department and node, so apparently physics department is far away from here, geographically and topologically both, because we have less overlaps. So you're going to see the network structure have a highly non-trivial structure. It is not random. You're going to see some department as a group to each other because they have more overlap compared to the rest of them. So there are some non-uniformities for the network. That is what we call the community structure for network science. And we should be able to figure it out and use this structure, we can either make a prediction or vice versa. So it's more or less a clustering algorithms related to the machine learning community. But in general, how can we model this type of network? So that would be a more theoretical problem. Hello. Yeah, just, just a question. In your definition of a complex system, you said no blueprint, no mastermind. Mm -hmm. um, one I think could certainly argue that a university with schools and departments has a blueprint is a mastermind or not, you know, depends on It depends on how you, that's right, that's right. I fully, I fully agree, it depends on how you define. But in, in general, what I, I claim here is about the definition says you don't just design system by single thinking, right? So the system, of course, have someone have more control power. But this not means you can really set up a system to all microscopic details. It's like you have one party have more strong interaction with others, for instance. But not means this small particle cannot have his own free will. <laughs> so we do have some free will, more or less, depends on how strong you are. So that is, that is the argument. And of course, if we have only single design, so we don't need to talk about it, we can solve the equation simply. That's, that's some, 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 some part we, I didn't mention because that would be a simple problem, relatively speaking. Now, if you do a, a larger scale, if I think about one industry as a single node now, so of course, inside the node, I have still have many nodes. And you're going to scale down and up. This is really a multi-scale scale problem. You can scale down and down. You have individual humans. You can even down some molecules, right? So you're going to go fundamental part, elementary particles, quarks, whatever, electrons. Now, of course, we need a cutoff. The discipline emerged because we introduced a cutoff, and that is the discipline we define here, I suppose in each industry is a single node. I simply interesting on the problem how the whole business goes. For instance, this is snapshot of biotech companies in the US it's in the 90s, last century. Uh, of course, again, this network is changing with the time. So the basic idea is each node have different roles. They have different interaction between each other. And then for instance, we have company research lab. They can either do cooperation, they can do the financial research and development. They have very different interaction between each other. So that is the second thing we're going to discuss. Given that, well, what kind of interactions are assigned for each link? They may have different interactions. It kind of you mix the different molecule together. Of course, the water and the other things. So you have different reactions. So you have a whole bunch of <laughs> complex system there. So how can we do it? And second. First of all, of course, given the structure, can we do learn something about structure? The second, what is the future of the network? <laughs> what going down or going up for the market? So that is important, right? We have a global picture. And so how can we design or have a better policy <laughs> for the whole system? So that's in your applications, do you so we do a lot of this in what we call graphical modeling? Mm -hmm. Do you and we also spend a lot of time worrying about how many of those edges are real? Right, whether we, whether we need a sparse representation of such a graph. Do you worry about those things in your application? We do, we do worry about it. It really depends on how, how, how precise the data set, the accuracy of the data set. So basically, this is kind of all the data. So nowadays, the data become more and more details, which, is, of course, it's not just a snapshot. You have time evolutions, so you know what kind of link get created, how you define first of the link, right? 
and then why it get, get created, the timestamps, and then why it destroyed. So basically, it's, n it's not just a network. It's a kind of interactions and, of course, time-dependent interactions between each other. For instance, if you make financial transaction between two companies, so I know this is financial transaction. I even know maybe the money, the amount of the money go from one, buy or purchase something. So that is more detailed information. And, and that kind of data, of course, only emerged very recently. By the time this network is drawn there, people, so we only have very bad resolution of the data. Financial world is much better. We have some bank offers credit card transaction data. So that's really the data we have. Each individual, we know how well, the timestamps, the amount of money go from one bank account to another. So that is a lot of information inside network. So you have really dynamic interactive between individuals and, of course, we may ask question about this type of system, for instance, what happened after crisis, how the uh, European uh, system get recovered, how the financial flow goes from one country to others, if you make a comparison before and after crisis. So you may learn something from there. Of course, this is very, very cost-grained analysis. It's not the key problem we're going to answer here. And Example, of course, neural network I already mentioned. There's other type of network biology, the human genes, metabolism pathways, uh, protein interactions, uh, huge, huge amount of different way you do. So basically, we have to, before to understand complex system, we first have to understand the structure, and that's, that's okay. Now, let me have quick our uh, are introduced about the network science field. This is a relatively new field. Areas emerged uh, maybe 20 years ago. So the first e e empirical observation networks, and of course, there's graph theory, mathematically, uh, long standing since old era. And then there's a random graph theory since Adish, right? So that's 50 years ago, half century years ago. But most of the time, those theories remain uh, theoretical things. So that's a more or less our first kind of observation of a real world network. This is done by physicists in Notre Dame. So they try to crowd the data from Notre Dame.edu. So this is website. So each page, you know how the hyperlinks go to other page in Notre Dame.edu. Or we can do the similar thing in Miami.edu, for instance. So we have a huge number of pages. Each page, we have hyperlinks goes out, and there's a hyperlink goes to me. So you're going to simply make a network. Each node is a page, and edges, of course, you have a direction from one page to others. So this is a visualized part. Now, the they found a very interesting properties. So if you plot the degree distribution, of course, the degree, we have two, in and out. Degree defines the number of hyperlinks to me, or I link to others. So how many hyper pages connect to me? It's an in inward degree, which is interesting. How many pages, of course, you get out. Now, for each node, if I calculate the degree for each node, I just plot a histogram. If I plot the distributions, you find this is what you can observe for the data. This is very striking because a simple random, work, a random graph model, as a random model can suggest, it is follows kind of binomial distribution or you take the scaling limit, you get a Poisson distribution. If you have a network, a fixed number of nodes, I randomly connect the edges with certain fraction, probability p. So you get a binomial distribution for each node, because I can have p, y minus p. Right? So, and of course, if the network is sparse enough, so, and make the angle to infinite, you get a Poisson distribution. So that is what we're going to expect originally. And that is what we found in the reality. And what is the difference? It is clear. The power will have much longer tail compared to exponential or Gaussian tails. I have example, two examples for you. Two real world network, both for traffic system. One comes from highway system, another from the airline system. So you're going to think about how the network gets constructed. Airlines, airport, one, then you get to another one. Right? Now, if you plot degree distributions for this one, you'll get something typical, of course. You have well-defined average values, average k plus minus the sigma. Now, that's how I'm going to hit. Now, if you plot this one, you get back this striking power law behavior. And the power law apparently have a big fraction of large nodes, for instance. Although, of course, it decay with a k, with a degree, 
you still observe some nodes that have huge number of connections over 100, even over 1,000. So, so you do see have big hubs on the map, for instance, Chicago. So those big hubs are never observed for this type of graphs. Random graph theory simply fails because there are no hubs. And more strikingly, if you study many different systems from different fields, for instance, the one I mentioned, you can make an internet, which is different because it's a hardware connection, the router is node. And then you have some biological system, protein interaction, of course, metabolic network, there's more and more data coming. This is pretty old data. You're going to see, roughly speaking, they all follow some kind of hollow degree distribution. So this is interesting to physicists because we are looking for some universal property instead of one particular system. The physicist first interesting is whether it's the power is striking for us. For some reason, I can explain later on a second. This is so universal, there must be something there. And this is different from our, our common understanding, common sense, right? So that is. So we coined the name, also called the scale-free network. So there's a, a list of uh, examples and the com are coming. Actually, there's more and more examples added to lists. And nowadays, people don't even want to mention this word because there are too many examples. So this is defaultly. I assume the network is scale free, except sometimes it is not. So you mention it. <laughs> That's something. Now, why I'm going to talk about the power law or well, scale free network? Because the physicists have a long time understanding about the power laws. The power law is extremely important for so called phase changing or critical phenomena. So here is an example. This is standard model in physics, so two-dimensional icing models. The icing model is you make a two-dimensional lattice, and then for each lattice, you have a small microscopic magnets up and down. So that's a model for ferromagnets. You have steel, how you get magnetizations. Of course, you have source and north. But what happens microscopically? Microscopic, of course, at each electron level, each atom level, you have spin for each electron. So you have a lattice, and then you have each electron sit on the lattice, then you have spin north and source. So that is source you observe for global magnetization. And of course, these micro magnets are not independent to each other because they're magnets. So if I goes up, the others close to me should goes up as well. So you have potential functions. I have more likelihood to be aligned same to my neighbors. So I up, my neighbor up going down, goes down. So this is nothing. If you construct a statistical model, this is one example of random Malkonian field. That's, that's a long time ago. That's a standard model in physics. Now, this model has a very striking property because we know this model is symmetric, up and down, microscopically. There is no preference. There is only preference for my neighbors. My neighbor have no preference. So you still have up and down symmetries. Right, so north and source. But how can we observe a magnetization globally? Because if it's random, the average magnetization should be zero. <laughs> because system is large enough. I have a huge system. So I don't have magnetization globally. How can, be, can I have a magnetization globally? A striking property of the, this, this icing model is if I control parameter temperature from high enough temperature to low enough temperature, the temperature controls coupling between neighbors. So if high enough temperature means they're decoupled, so they're just independent. And then, of course, you know, you can imagine there is no magnetization globally. Average up and down becomes 0. 1 minus 1 sum up becomes 0. Now, if the temperature cool down below the critical temperature, we call it Curie temperature, then suddenly you have so-called magnetization. So this is surprising because it breaks down the original symmetry of microscopic level, right? So suddenly at a certain temperature, most of the magnets go to one direction. Of course, the choice could be random. But once it determines, it determines. This is called a spontaneous symmetry break. So symmetry breaking is not because of microscopic foundation, because of collective. 
And that is surprising. That is surprising to physics. We can just use this simple model explain what happened in reality. So this is one of the basic model. Now, the problem is even more interesting when it go to so-called critical point, one temperature right on the temperature I moving from one phase to another phase. <laughs> right? So at below lower temperature phase, I have ferromagnets. In the high temperature phase, I have random paramagnet phase. Now, the Tc, T equal to critical temperature point between these two phases is interesting. So this is a plot about these models, the black white, you can simply think about this is up and down spins. All right, so white go this direction, black go inside. Now I have different, very complex structure. I can do statistics for size of cluster, for instance. For instance, I have very small cluster here, many of them. Oops. Occasionally, I have a bigger one. Right? So if I m make a statistics over cluster, side distribution, I get a single problem. That's the power rule you observe for two-dimensional icing model. You get a power rule. The power rule have nice property. If I do scaling transformation, if I zoom in or zoom out this structure, I simply factorize, multiply s by a constant. But this constant do not change distribution because the constant simply factorize out. I just cancel by normalization constant. So nothing changes for the power law distribution because it is scaling invariant. And even more general, what you can prove, actually, there is an elegant theory in the theoretical physics. You can prove at a critical point, the whole system, the whole measure of the probability becomes scaling invariant instead of one distribution. The whole statistical measure becomes scaling invariant. This is called the conformal field theory in physics literature. But anyway, this raises a lot of power laws. For instance, the correlation function between two pair of particles, up and down. Of course, you can imagine if I am in two, one of the phase, you have some sharp decay. So you have a typical lens. So if I'm far away from you, of course, I'm close to you. I may like more like with you. My second neighbor, slightly like as the first one. The so third neighbor decays. And then you have exponential cutoff. The cutoff tells about the typical domain of the size. Now you have power rule. The power rule means you do not have typical size. And the correlation function also goes as a power rule. So they have a huge number of power rules. They are all related to each other. There are only two exponents determining the whole system, which you can prove for this, for this, this nice model. Now, what is important geometrically, this becomes some stochastic fractal. So you can scale in and out. You get a similar structure. Now we. I apply the similar idea here to networks. So the network I have for the webs, I, we define some algorithms on the original network, just like a coarse green picture we have before for the icing model. Now we group some of nodes as a super nodes. So we reduce the degree of freedom. We reduce the degree of freedom, we end up with a network, of course, a small number of nodes. And you can repeat this scaling transformation many steps. However, there is an important property preserve under this scaling transformation. You're going to see, for instance, their center, we have hubs. Of course, this depends on how you plot the network. But anyway, you have hub here, and then the hub reserve the hubs. And if you plot a degree distribution, of course, originally you have power rule, you're going to see all sorts of network preserve the power rule degree distributions. So that is important. The power rule degree distribution is scaling environment and such kind of cross green picture. And we can do even more <coughs> details. For instance, we can work out different exponent of network. For instance, the power of degree distribution, we have gamma, they are fractal dimension and related. There are other exponent related. So these exponents are not independent. And so you can work it out mathematically how to do it. And then we make a very nice prediction with empirical data across different networks. So this is a really universal property. And scale free network is indeed free of scale. So we can zoom in and out. We have different scales, but you have some constant property. So this is a work a long time ago, 10 years ago almost. Now we can go more, we can apply so-called our standard field theory tools, renormalization group flows, apply to this one, just trying to understand how the system goes with scaling transformations. And then we can characterize 
a different network system, protein. The Russian IMDB is actor networks, actor connect to each other if they play in the same field. And then you have some, some metabolic networks, webs. So we do have some, some phase diagram for those different network structures based on those exponents we measure. And we, um, we can also apply the tools to do something more realistic, for instance, more important for community detection. For instance, we know the function modules are more close to each other. So this is some well-known property for related with function in the uh, biological network and the network structure. So you're going to see some, there are some groups. Now, the idea here is trying to apply such a renormalization idea to group the nodes to a smaller clusters, coarse green picture, and how this can be mapped out as dendrogram. So how the dendrogram come from? It's kind of you reverse the, the coarse green procedure to up, and then you go more and more. So that is how the system goes. So you're going to see some functionalities emerge because we have such a property in networks first. And second, we can use the tools, the algorithm, to do something important. We can also apply to detect or to understand the transport flow, for instance, metabolic network, the number of the metabolism flags between each other. We can not run into the network on the original network, which is sometimes too big. We can just use a small cross green network as small sampling. So you still control the most essential part. So you still capture the main flags. And that one we compare with two networks. One is cross green, the one is original network. We do have very similar result between each other. Another topic is very related with this one, with this network phase transition, is about procurations. And procuration, in the, of course, procuration can be defined in the arbitrary dimension, arbitrary network. But this is a relatively simple model. The random, random graph, edge models, edge random graph model, we only have one control parameter, which is the probability I connect to neighbors. <laughs> which you define, uh, mostly speaking, the average degree. Suppose the number of nodes go to infinite. <laughs> Interesting on large system, we only have average degree to control the whole system. Now we can control this parameter p continuously, but there is something discontinuity happen. That is important because once you calculate the size of joint component, the largest connected component, the size of largest component divided by the whole system, which, of course, the probability to find the nodes belong to a larger component. Now, this probability, 0 to 1, if I have huge enough this turn, you're going to see for p more than 1, this is almost 0. So you have 0 measure to find a node belongs to a cluster, round cluster. Now, for p greater than 1, you have a finite probability, a larger probability. Interestingly, of course, this point is not an object. Right, so this derivative here and derivative here is discontinuous. And that is one typical example of phase transition. So there are some discontinuity emerge. And this idea, of course, there's a lot of mathematical tools we can apply, but we can also apply this thing to scale-free network, which is more realistic now, because now we know the scale-free network has other property of scaling environment. But we can still do this one. We can do some analytical solution to get this procreation limit. Now, so far, we just uh, discussed about our static structure of networks. But more importantly, of course, it's about dynamics. And this is also more important, recent, more recently, more <laughs> getting more and more important, because the st st structure already has been studied for over 20 years. So now we are interested more about how the network change with time. Now, there are two types of network dynamics. One, of course, we call network evolution, so how network change. Network evolution include new nodes come in, new nodes, uh, old nodes get out, new edge get created, some edge get destroyed. So, right, so that's the part. And second is about network analysis about some, something assigned to each node. For instance, for in this example, for internet, if we measure each node, we can measure the traffic flow on the node. So, basically, you pick two nodes, you measure traffic with the time, the number of the bytes coming to this one. You already see something highly non-trivial. Of course, the network itself is evolving. But each node has a very complex structure associated on that. 
you know, think about stock market, you be on the network. Of course, there's a network, but we don't know. We only observe this. This is already enough. Was a lot of study this is called serial time series analysis, independent field. But you think about now we have networks, <laughs> so we have more understanding. Why they're gonna appear? So we should have some feeling about why such structure are different because there's interaction are different. So how this interaction related with this dynamic quantities? So that will be important. Similar thing you're gonna think about web pages, right? So webs have visitation patterns that are different across different nodes. Now along this direction, I I did some uh, just like physically speaking, this is kind of toy model for our paper citation system. <laughs> so that is something uh, the scientists are going to get interesting because everyone is interested on how much I'm going to gain when I make a production, a paper. <laughs> so a product, how much I'm going to gain and receive afterwards. Unfortunately, we have a very nice data, data set coming from physical review system. A physical review is a flagship journal series in the physics world. You, we have the data since the creation, so which means we have over 100 years long. So that is a long time span paper record. And of course, we know for each paper who cited it and why it gets published, abstracts, uh, titles, all sorts of information. So there's a lot of things you can think about. I can classify the, use the topic model, I can figure out keywords, etc. Now, the one thing we're interested in here is simply about number of citations. Number of citations, this is the example. I plot it for paper published in the 1960s, so 10 years. Um, you're going to see for each of code corresponding one of the papers. So uh, at first glance, there's not much information you're going to learn from this mass <laughs> plot. Now, fortunately, also, oh, one thing I'm going to mention, the system also grows exponentially. This is well known as a Morse law. So the number of papers published per year, linear, linear plot, you have uh, incremental curve. If you have semi log plot, you get more or less exponential. And we know, roughly speaking, after each 17 years, the paper get doubled every year, every 17 years. So more and more paper. <laughs> but 17 years, not bad still. Now, we have a very nice model. I, cannot, I don't have time to explain the detail of the models, but take an example of the model. We have four different citation patterns from four papers. And for, of course, this red, red one is clearly a very successful paper. So you get more and more citation every year, even after 30 years. It's very successful and gain more and more citation, of course. This is kind of Nobel Prize paper, so that is a successful paper. The blue one is the typical, <laughs> typical got citations, <laughs> and then no one knows about it. There's some, some I would say, still very successful paper. It's a very long lifetime longevity, so you, you don't have much citation, but still it can span longer. And this this one is something in between, so it's still longer. But so they all look different. But we have a model. We we had a model about networks, but the byproduct of the network model has <laughs> about citation because we know citation is nothing but just the degree of the network. So we have a dynamic network model. We're going to predict how the degree changes with the time. And for each, each paper, we have three parameters associated with, with this uh, citation pattern. So lambda, mu, and sigma. So each corresponding this, we call novelty parameter, quant whatever. This is called in immediacy, which corresponding over time, get attention. Sigma is the longevity of the curve. Now, if you transfer this function, I, I do, for instance, I divide by this, I take a log here, so I make a transformation. I have, if I have propagate the parameter for each citation, I have a simple curve here. The S, C, the citation after transformation, T after transformation should be universal. This is uh, the cumulative distribution of the Gaussian. So that's normal distribution. Now, that's what we have for these four different papers. We're going to simply collapse them together to work. That's nice. And we have this plot for uh, various different journals, not only limited on physical review paper. We, later, we got the web of science data. So we have nature science and you know whatever journal you can imagine there. 
So what, what is what's the implication of that? What does that mean? The fact that they all map. Oh, this means actually I mean, there are some model assumption there. So this confirms the model assumption. It just verified. But on the other hand, of course, you can go back to this one. You can make some prediction on, on top of this uh, model. And this is the example we're going to see the real data and the con reconstructed data from the model, of course. There are something similar. There are something different. For instance, we do not capture those oscillations. This is because our short time scale behavior we are capture long time scale behavior, which is important for long term prediction. Because most of the time, people just use two year citation to, to say about your futures, for instance, impact fact. <laughs> the impact fact is average two year citation, even not about your paper, about all the paper average in that journal, right? Nature, science, those journal. Now, first of all, we compare. We make actually very, very, very detailed comparison between these two. But I don't mention here. But anyway, this have much better performance in terms of capture long term predictions. Now I'm going to switch to another related topic. This topic is about human mobility, human motions. So how about human movement? And of course, at the first, I'm going to date back to Einstein's original work, 1905 paper. One of his famous 1905 paper. One is about the relativity, of course. Another one is about the random work. Now, there's a famous story about this. This is mean square displacement goes to scale with a T. This is a famous noun. Suppose you have a large suspended particle in the water. If you put a microscope, you can observe, of course, not water molecule, but you can observe the motion of the suspended particles. It moves some trajectory like this. We call this is Brownian motion. Brownian, the first one observed this one. Now, microscopy, this is nothing because this suspended large particle is collided by the others. So you have a lot of collisions by small molecules that make it change with the time. And you can make random work models. So this is one of the start, starting paper about random work models in the statistical field. Also, about the first paper about random work mathematical models of the whole world. And eventually, of course, this becomes so important to go to financial world, to go to many, many different places. But anyway, that is something important to us. Now, we want to know human motion, so we do something for similar animals. This is a typical example for animals, monkeys motion from the data here. So there's a paper, apparently, of course, 30 years ago, but this is interesting. If you put a GPS on top of the monkey and observe over a period, you're going to reconstruct the trajectory of monkeys. That's how it goes. Now, one thing important here is you're going to see, sorry for this one, the jump side distribution, the distribution over jump, of jump for two consecutive points the follows a delta r goes minus 1 plus alpha, a power rule distributed. So this becomes something different because the random work model need the central limit theory, which means the second moment should be converged. Now, for alpha is more than two, the second one not converge. So you go to another universality class, which is a very stable distribution. So everything changes, the scalability changes. Now, you can prove the delta x to the alpha now goes to t before alpha equal to two. Now, the alpha x going to come in this jump side distribution. What, so are? what do you mean? What is the R? Alpha. No, the R. Ah, delta R. Delta R is the distance between two consecutive jumps. So you have some big. So power rule means it's not narrow. Brownian motion, you just move small. Of course, most of the time, you still move small step, but occasionally, you have big jump. That is important. Now, how about human motion? So we got a data set from a cell phone company. So we have a big data set, 7 billion million anonymized data about each individual. So it's big. So we record each time one individual may place a call to his friends. Of course, we have a social network. But besides the research on social networks, we do have individuals trajectory because we know the place the nearest cell phone tower place the call. However, we do have better resolution space and temporal wise. But we have big data set, long time observation. So we can do something about statistics. We cannot say much, maybe, about one individual. It depends, of course, how this individual behaves. Now, 
just to mention, we have some work similar done by other groups. They are trying to do a similar work, but uh, not use the cell phone data, use the banknotes data. So this is a famous website called wheresgeorgia.com. Some of you may have heard about it. You upload your $1 bill numbers um, to the website, and many people play with a huge online games. So eventually, you're going to track the motion of an individual. Right, individual bill, dollar bill, not the individuals, but individual dollar bill. So there's a nice model. You're going to prove if you just replace the Einstein's more random work model by far tail the jump side and waiting time distribution, assume everything random. So this is called the continuous time random work model, a general speaking. And then you have very nice agreement with the motion of dollar bills. However, this is also confirmed by our experiments. Like we can measure this jump side distribution, waiting time distribution, how long you spend a place, what is jump side between two consecutive, you have a nice one. However, we do observe something more complicated compared to the dollar bills. Because, for instance, if we pick up one trajectory, one person, individual moves, and each dot here is cell phone tower, so that is how, how this looks like. And you can construct so-called mobility network. You had each node corresponds to one location. The size is proportional to the frequency of the visitation. And then the edge, of course, is connected to two nodes if there there are trajectory between one of them. The network will have highly non-trivial structure. So this is highly non-trivial structure emerged. And then we have some a list of observations different from previous model. The continuous time random work model. I don't want to explain the detail, but for instance, you're going to see the location occupation is highly inhomogeneous. You can make so called safe plot. The first top, top most likely location, second most likely location with the rank, you get one over rank. So this is not in the model, in, in previous model. Now we make a very nice uh, stochastic model. We capture the model, almost most of the features. And for instance, we can solve the model analytically. So this is analytical curve, and this is a simulation. So we do have all those properties are learned from the data, statistically speaking, and that is how. And also, this is important. We have very, uh, very slow diffusions. This is not parallel. You have double logarithmic curve diffusion. So it's a logarithmism diffuse because this is highly, diff highly trapped by locations, individual motion compared to just a random work. When the work you have power law. No matter it's separate diffusion or super diffusion, you always have power law. But this you got an uh, extremely slow one. You're going to plug in the exponent observed from the data and compare. And we have pretty nice agreement. And then you, of course, you can ask about individuals. There's a lot of work done by individuals. How can I make a prediction by individuals? Then there's a lot of statistical tools you can use. For instance, there's a model to a hidden Markovian process. Now, we have a science paper. We are trying to understand what is the limit of the prediction, how much you can predict in the extreme case and compare it to the existing tools. So that is some, some interesting paper we have for the up bound and lower bound for the predictive power about individual motions and then related to some previous work. You can also combine two layer problems, social networks, which is for here is cell phone phone call network. I know who I'm contacting. And I also know these two individuals are moving. So they should be somehow related. And actually, it is true, for instance, if you make some measure, some feature you get from mobility, the correlation function between two mobility patterns, and the correlation function from two individuals on network, for instance, the common neighbors, sure, the number of shared neighbors. We have see, of course, the mobility measure have highly correlated by itself. No, that's just a person correlation coefficient. No matter how you define, they are highly correlated. Network measure, there's a list of network measure people present in the previous studies. They are also highly correlated. However, we have some partly correlation between mobility and networks. So there are the two uh, information from here. They are not uncorrelated. Which means there is very important. They can you can use this one to infer this or vice versa, and more importantly, they are not highly correlated. So the information is not completely redundant. 
So basically, if you combine both mobility and network information to make some prediction, you get much better predictive power compared to a single tools. People just use, for instance, network prediction about the edges, whether these two become new friends later on or not, based on network. How many things you're going to think about? How many common neighbors I have? How many network structure I'm going to have? Now, if you put mobility part, you have more predictive power. Now, in the last, in the end, very recent, last year, we make uh, this mobility study to a much, much larger scale. So it's about uh, the whole cultures. It's not about one, one country. So this is the data we get over 2,000 years. <laughs> That's long. And across all notable people, now we don't have much information of individuals' movements. Of course, some of them have more records. <laughs> some of them have few records. But two, there's two baselines. At least for most of them, we know where he born and where he died. So we have a birth and death place as a simplified trajectory for each individual. Now, of course, we have no much information about individual, but we have more information about the location. <laughs> if we do aggregate across the whole area, so we know how the center of the cultures shift or shift from one to others. So that is interesting because this is a collaboration did with some historian and uh, humanist. So originally, I mean, they they doing things just reading literature. I mean, this is a traditional study, you know, kind of very different study. And now, of course, we have a new field called digital community. But most of the time, it is still trying to do a simple things just of course we now we start have big data but still something simple now this kind of new approach called computational humanity so we do have some computational tools to apply to humanity and to make some predictive power to the future for instance cultural trends how how you're going to change of course we know for each notable people different professions so there are something in very interesting behind the data set besides this paper but there is more information we should be able to dig out. So I'm still working on that type of uh, data set. All right, so I, 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 I think I'm almost be there for so the time. So this is a reference paper I mentioned in my slide. And, and I think that would be a very nice opportunity to be here just to give a talk because, um, again, I'm a statistical physicist. I'm doing something applied to big data, but still. I, I are limited by my own point of view. I was still thinking about that way. So it's better we're going to have some good communication between uh, across different uh, disciplines. So it's a really fantastic opportunity to, to be here, give a talk. Thank you. <laughs>